Well, how's it going? I'm Mark Duffy. Welcome to my channel. We're doing something new today. We're moving Duffer's Tuesday tips from my Insta stories to now my YouTube channel and my podcast channel as well. So you can either watch the video or you can listen to it as you please. You can check it out on all the available podcasts. You can check it out here on YouTube. So without further ado, let's just roll the titles and answer some questions. <laughs> Right, so how this is going to work is on a Monday, I'm going to put on my story and I'm going to open up the questions to all my followers on Instagram to submit in the questions. And then on a Tuesday, I'll record my answers and then you have them available that day on both YouTube and podcast, just like today. So these questions are going to be... So these questions I'm about to answer right now were submitted yesterday by my uh, followers. Now, because it was a new format, not as many people actually submitted in questions, which is good. We get a quick and easy intro into this because this, you know, I don't know how this is going to play out. This could be an absolute disaster, but I do want to do more podcasts. So it is going to be a more regular thing. The great thing about podcasts that I see is I can freely share my opinions and I don't have any restrictions, whether it's a cursing or, you know, just being totally honest with both Instagram and YouTube, you kind of, I feel you kind of have to hold back a little bit, but on podcasts, it's it's a free reign. So let's get into some of these questions that were uh, submitted yesterday on my Instagram page. So the first question we're going to answer is from Tyrrell's Town and he's asking, if it loads, he's asking best way to grow on Facebook and Twitter. Um, we'll we'll address the Twitter one first. I have no idea how to work Twitter. Uh, I've been on Twitter for years. I barely have seventeen hundred followers. Um, it used to be that you use hashtags. It doesn't seem to be the case anymore. I don't really don't know. Um, it baffles me. There's times that my photos do so well, and then other ones tank. And I've done the exact same practice from one to the next. Um, I sometimes use hashtags. I sometimes don't. The the trend at the minute with Twitter is kind of um and it and it absolutely drives me insane. Uh, whoa, just turned the vibration alert off my phone there. <laughs> I am professional, I promise. Um one one thing that I notice on Twitter is the fact that those with smaller accounts do this whole photographers, show me your best photos that you took on a Tuesday or show me your best photos with a dragon. And it's just like, yeah, everyone's doing that. Everyone's doing the whole Twitter call out photographers to share their photos on your page to do to do these fake retweets. It's like Twitter's answer to follow one follow if you want to. It's it's kind of annoying when it comes on to your feed if you're following it and that's photography related and all you're seeing is these, hey, photographers, hey, photographers can kind of get annoying. But if you want a quick way to maybe push a page on a bit that'd be one thing I'd, I'd, I'd advise on now to grow on Facebook Facebook's kind of gotten pretty good lately uh, since June I've grown about nearly 3,000 followers and all I'm doing is sharing my photos on my page on my personal page so I have a photography page obviously and then I have my own personal page which I've had for you know since the start of Facebook and then what I do as well is so I'll share it on the photography page I'll then share it on my personal page which is kind of like what you're going to do when you're if you're on LinkedIn as well you'll have your business page and then you obviously will share it onto your personal page and if you have any other friends share it to them too um but anyway back to Facebook so Share it on your business page, your photography page, share it on your personal page, and then share it on groups because the groups are going to be completely, you know, uh, you've got like in Dundalk, you've got Dundalk North End and Friends, Dundalk Photo and Crack, or uh, you think you've got uh, Dundalk Photography. So you've three pages just to the Dundalk area alone. Um, and the thing about these is if you can actually join the groups with your photography page, it benefits you more because you can use the invite button. So every time someone likes, a photo of yours, go in and see who's actually liked it and you'll see beside her name, it'll say invite and you invite the person. And it's it that is the secret to growing on Facebook currently. Now, the other side of things about Facebook is the fact that even if you have 13,000 followers or you have 1,000 followers, it doesn't get shown to many of your followers. So that's the other side of things as well. It's not like Instagram, it's not like Twitter. They still hold your page back a bit, but it is nice. Like, you know, like when I hit 10K followers, they reviewed my page and said, because I had a blue tick on Instagram, they're going to give me a blue tick on Facebook. So that was pretty cool. Wasn't expecting it, didn't apply for it. You know, chance my arm at Instagram. We all know the story there. You know, I was just a bluffer as always and got granted on Instagram. So that's how you grow on Facebook is share it on groups that are relevant to what you're sharing and be so just pay attention to the rules because the groups are very pernickety 
and a little bit sad, if I'm totally honest, with some of the rules. So don't be putting on the caption, prints available, because that's seen as selling and most groups won't let you sell. Like, even if it says on your caption, prints available, markduffyphotography.com, they'll remove the post because of that, because it's, it's, um, inadvertently, not inadvertently, but it's, uh, it's set, you're selling and that's against the rules. So when you're joining a group, make sure you read through the rules. And if you don't agree to the rules, don't join the group because you will get your post removed and you will get kicked out of the group. So, and it's just a headache. I've been, I've had a post removed and I've had to leave some groups and I've been kicked out of other groups. So it can be a pain. On to the next question. So the next question is coming from Brian Zhang. And this one is a tutorial of portrait editing, like face skin. So he's uh, so he's asking about is it a he? I can't remember now. Yeah, Brian, wasn't it? Yeah, Brian. <laughs> Short down memory. Uh, so he's looking to see about a tutorial for skin retouching. The best thing I can tell you is just Google high frequency separation. It's exactly what I use when I'm doing skin retouching, but you don't necessarily need to use that uh, too much for close ups. Yeah, full body stuff. No, not really. Dodging and burning is the next thing as well. So uh, that way I don't have a tutorial on any of these. I don't know if I'm going to continue doing tutorials on Photoshop and stuff because there's so much of that stuff out there already and I'm just really regurgitating what I've learned from YouTube. So you're best off just actually going and looking through YouTube and finding the tutorials. Um, hit me up on a DM and if I if I know uh, if I know the link off by off offhand quick enough I'll be able to send the link to you. If it's something that I have to, if it was a link that I found years ago and I may not be able to, I'm not going to, I'm going to be honest, I'm not going to spend 20 minutes searching YouTube to find something I searched for years ago. Like, you know, I do think at, at times people need to do their own research, but if I can quickly find it for you, I will and I'll send the link to you. Uh, so that's the best thing I, I will tell you is look up dodging and burning, look up high frequency separation and they're going to be the main tricks, that you're, not tricks, but they're going to be the name, the main techniques to use for editing portraits. So I hope that helps. Uh, the next one is from, what's the next one from? RB Model Training. I, I can't see the full name. So um, what power settings are your lights? Uh, I'm going to take it that you're asking what power are my lights, not actually the settings, because like I'm using uh, Aperture 100D for this video and I have it set to 6%. So the light settings are quite small because the power of this light is huge and I'm using F1.8 as my aperture for the video because I'm using that lovely... Sony 20mm f1.8. It's a beaut. Oh, it's beaut. Um, so the lights that I have, obviously I have the Aperture 100D behind me in the softbox there. I have another video light, which is the uh, Godox SL60W. When it comes to my strobes, I'm using Godox 8400, 8200, and then I have a whole load of MS300s. So they're ranging from a 200 watt hour strobe like the 8200 to the MS300s are 300 watts and then the 8400 are 400 watts. So that's what I'm using when it comes to my strobe lighting. So I think that I think that's what you're, what you're asking there is the what strength of the strobes do I have? Um, when it comes to settings, it's totally dependent on your aperture, your ISO. Shutter speed has nothing to do with the power of your strobes. It won't affect it at all. It just controls the ambient light. So you'll always just go to the highest sync speed uh, make sure your scene is black so then you can control the light from your strobes. Next question is coming from AH Photos and they're asking, what would you recommend for storing, backing up external hard drives or cloud storage? Actually, what I use is it's kind of like a cloud storage and it's it's a NAS server. So I'm using the Synology. Uh, what is it? It is, I can see it here beside me. It's the DS218. I didn't even go for the plus. I just went for the DS218. So it has two bays on it and I have two three terabyte drives on it and I can access that anywhere I want. And it's just, it basically is a home server. Now I will be upgrading those drives very soon because I'm going to run out of space quite soon because I nearly ran out of space last year. Um, so when the drives come cheaper, I might look into getting maybe two eight terabyte drives. And that means then, so it, it, I know what people may be thinking as well, Two eight terabytes, that means you've 16 terabytes on it. You currently have two trees, which means you've six terabytes. So it's three terabytes writable and three terabytes backup, and it automatically backs up to it. So when you have two drives, just remember if you're trying to, you know, kind of, if you're like, I can't afford three terabytes, maybe I'll get two, two terabytes. Just remember that you're writing to one, you're writing to a two terabyte drive and you're backing up to a two terabyte drive. So even though you have four terabytes, you only have two terabytes usable. So when you are looking into that kind of system, just remember that. But it's good, the fact that you have a backup, you know, and um, 
Now I would say as well, because they're standard hard drives, I don't edit from them. So I will use the SSD drive that's in my computer. I will edit from there. And when I'm finished the edits, you know, when I'm finished with the client working on it there and it's fully paid for and everything out there, I'll go through the files. First of all, delete the ones that I'm not using, the ones that weren't going to be seen by the client and all that there. I don't keep any of that. I delete all of that. And then what I do is I get those files, have them all folded nicely and I bring them into the Synology and I archive them. So I use the Synology as an archive. So if I have any active files to stay on my SSD, because the SSD is going to be the fastest for editing. So that's how I work them files as well. So I've answered a little bit more. And this is one thing I'm loving about. I don't have a limit here. I can talk as much as I want right now. And we all know I love the sound of my own voice. So this is the great thing about me doing the video and I, I, as a podcast as well. Um, I'm not limited to try and get these answers that people ask me within 15 seconds. It's been the, of the last two and a half years, that's been the, the biggest bane of it all is trying to get complicated answers answered in 15 seconds. And because I speak quite fast, some people don't understand me. As you notice, I haven't actually slowed my speech down, so I'm not doing that either. If you can't keep up, I'm sorry. This is how I talk. So the next question is coming from Paul Burke. Not the Paul Burke that I've headed out on photo shoots with. This is a different Paul Burke. And he's asking, best portable portrait setup, light in softbox, etc. Um, I would say for portability, uh, you'd be talking to Godox 8200. It's, a, it's the size of a full length speed light. So a speed light fully folded out. And it has the power of a strobe. And then you can, you know, use your attachments onto um, softbox and stuff. Now, some could say, why don't you just suggest a speed light? And the problem with speed light is if you're doing, uh, you know, shoots that are in bright daylight, your speed light isn't going to be powerful enough to get you the light that you want. And that also goes for the speed lights that have high speed sync. Even if they have high speed sync, which isn't great to use either. And I'll talk about that on a, on a, different, on a different episode. That's a whole different subject. But... Um, even with high speed sync, the speed light is not going to be capable enough to get the results that you want. So you need to go for more something that's more suited and, and more built for purpose, which is the 8200. I've seen now Godox have 8100s, which are like small strobes, and then the 8300 is a little bit bigger. The 8400 is great, fantastic, but it is a big unit. So if you're looking for portability to fit in your camera bag, I would say the 8200 and then um, an umbrella. I bought a 65 inch umbrella, it folds up to absolutely nothing, it's much easier to carry around in a softbox and uh, it could be even easier to mount onto the 8200. I think that the adapter that sits on the bottom of the 8200 has an umbrella attachment to it. I d I'll have to check that one out, but I think that has an umbrella attachment to it. So if that is the case, then I would tell you, get a, a reverse umbrella so one that you shoot into not one that you shoot through but one that you shoot into and reflects back out again so get one of those like a deep a deep they're, they're known as deep umbrellas so get one of those and then your 8200 onto a nice decent light stand don't cheap out in your light stand get a nice heavy duty light stand get it air cushioned as well so if if some of your if you didn't tighten enough and it drops, it doesn't slam down. There's a piston inside, well, a fake piston. It adds air to it, so it means it just it gradually drops down in steps, so it won't slam and fall over and break out. And so make sure you get a heavy duty air cushion stand, eighty two hundred, and then looked at um, some reverse uh, umbrellas or deep umbrellas, however you want to call them. I can't remember the the, the full term with them at the minute, but um, yeah, uh, that was that one. Uh, let's see, the next question is coming from Front Row Photography, and it's uh, renovating. The the shed for a product photography studio does it matter what color i paint the walls now it depends if you paint the walls white that is going to affect you it definitely is going to affect you because the light's going to bounce around and um yeah it could if you go for a neutral color don't be going around pinks and greens and stuff like that there even in my studio here people say like how does the green acoustic foam not affect your colors because um it can bounce, you know, light bounces everywhere. And just like sound, the reason why I have the acoustic foam is to catch the sound from when it bounces off walls. You need to treat the walls with color. If you if you paint the walls black, it is absolutely, it's definitely going to absorb your uh, some of your light. So I would say dark colors so it doesn't actually affect your studio. So you can really then, um, so then you can really fine tune your lighting and the walls aren't going to affect it. But definitely, like, you know, if you're going to be like, it depends on the shed, what height's the shed? Are you using eight foot ceilings? Are you using seven foot ceilings? Like, that's going to have an impact with light reflecting back off the ceiling. So, you know, I'd nearly paint the ceiling black. Um, if it was me, like I, I painted the walls in this studio grey, but the ceiling's white. If I was to do it again, I probably would paint the ceiling uh, grey as well. Have it nice and dark and neutral. 
but uh, that's what I would say. So yeah, surprisingly enough, the walls do have an impact. The paint, sorry, the color of the walls have an impact on your photography. So the next next question coming in is from Sam, and he is asking um, Photoshop actions or no, oh, what's this one? Photoshop actions. Obviously, I haven't read these. I don't. I never read them. I read them ahead of time. Uh, and normally with you know with the stories, I don't have to actually read them out. You can read them, and I just answer them. Photoshop action packs or do it all DIY. Trying to decide if I should get some. Um, I will tell you this. I'm doing graphic design since probably about 2008, and I can probably list on one hand the many times I've used Photoshop Actions. The problem I find with Photoshop Actions are they've been designed for people to suit the needs of what they were designing it for, and then they've just sold it to you after the fact. So you're going to find that even with the Actions, they're probably going to do something quirky. Like if you look at... um. What was the one we used? When I was in Boys Sports, we used one before. We bought one and it was a headache. If you didn't do it specifically to the way it was needed with the action, it was, it was, it really was just an absolute headache to deal with. And I think it was, um, yeah, dispersion. So have you seen the ones? It looked basically like the, uh, like, the Infinity Wars when they dust out. You know, you know that effect? So that's called dispersion. And you can get actions on graphicriver.net. You can pay for it. Or you can find some free ones. GraphicRiver.net is a great, great website if you're looking for any of those, um, for any kind of Photoshop actions, uh, if you're looking for PSD files for anything really. It doesn't even have to be Photoshop. It can be Illustrator. It can be InDesign. They have templates for everything. And they don't just cover just graphics. They have like they have a whole lot of sister websites. So you've got Audio Jungle. You've probably heard of that for royalty free music. Uh, Video Hive for royalty free videos and templates for After Effects and stuff like that. There, so it's a, it's one of the best websites that I know of online for buying all this kind of stuff. And we bought a dispersion pack of them, and it was a headache if you didn't have the file and you have to use specific photos that that suit it. Not every photo is gonna isn't isn't gonna suit it. Same way if you looked at that tutorial I did of the double exposure when. I I even I, I said it in the video this technique is not going to suit all photos you really have to judge it on the photo but it can be handy and you can set up actions all you want if you learn how to do say the Orton effect which is everyone knows I use that for my uh, landscape photography you can set up an action so you don't have to go through all them steps the problem is you will eventually forget how to do it and that's why I don't have actions set up. Like I use it on all my landscape photography and I can easily set it up bing bang bosh on, on an action hit play it does it for me, and then I don't have to think about it. I just have to tweak it how I want, and then save the file, and then post it later on. But I don't. I go through all the rigmarole of all the shortcuts and all that there, and you know, like you know, duplicating the layer twice, adding the blur to the bottom one, applying layer, change the bend mode to screen, get the top one, add a sharpening through high pass filter, set the uh, set the blend mode to linear light, group them bring them down in opacity to usually 40, 50%. So if anyone wanted to know about Orton effects, there you go. You know how to do it. That's how I do the Orton effect. Um, and the great thing is you can rewind here. It's great. I love this. I'm going to stop selling the fact that I'm loving the fact that this doesn't just die after 24 hours and I get to talk way more in depth about these subjects because that's a difficult one there. Actions, 15 second answer is, mm, yeah, but you're going to run into issues. I don't know if it's worth buying. So that's my quick answer to that one. Uh, if you can get a free one, try out a free Photoshop action, see what you think about it. And then if it is a thing that you are like, oh, you know what, I actually could benefit from it, then maybe actually get into doing using uh, Photoshop actions. Personally, I would use them as a way to learn how someone did something. Else. Same with Lightroom presets. Uh, a lot of times it's just marketing bullshit. But, you know, there's other times it's great for learning how to if there is a specific way you want to edit your photos, you can learn how someone does it and then tweak it to suit your style. And always, I would always, always, always teach people that don't just take it as ones and zeros. This is not binary. Do you know, look at how someone's done it and then see what way it suits your style. Not everyone's style is the same. So, you know, uh, that's the only thing I would say about that there. Uh, so, Sean Berry is uh, is asking thoughts on the Canon RP for first mirrorless full frame camera. Um, yeah, I think I can't remember. I honestly cannot remember the specs that are on the RP. Um, I don't really, I haven't really been taking much note of what Canon are producing because I've been so impressed by Sony. Uh, so if you found that the RP was in around the same price as the A7 III, I probably would tell you to go to the A7 III for this one reason. 
all the lenses on Sony are native to it. You don't need an adapter. You don't need an adapter. Even Sigma, and you'll see it, you'll see it there in the background. Sigma released the 150 to 600. It used to be for Canon and Nikon. They've never released it for Sony. That is the Sony mount. I changed it. I, I, I traded it back into cons and I got a new one and it's now the Sony Fit. So none of my lenses for Sony need an adapter. While with the Canon R, unless you get the RF lenses, you're going to be using adapters left, right and centre. And they have some beautiful L lenses from back in the day, like the 16 to 35 f4. One of the best lenses you can use for landscape photography. The old, even the old 70 to 200 f2.8, f, uh, Mark II IS. Even the Mark I, it's just, it weighs a ton. It's a tank. Great lenses. But you need adapters now to use them on the Canon system. That's the one thing I don't like about Canon and Nikon, moving the mirrorless. It's just like, why? You didn't need to do this. And it was, ju it's, it's money. That's all it was. I don't care what anyone says. You can you can say what you like. It's a hundred percent all about money when it comes to that. Anyway, so I don't know. I I, I really don't know if it is comparable. Um, so I'm trying to remember the specs now of the A7 III, 26 megapixels. So is the RP around that? I think it's maybe. I think the RP is actually 30 megapixels. But if it if they're in around the same price, around about 1500 euro, I would tell you to go Sony. And uh, final question, like I said, not many not many questions came in because people were used to asking questions on Tuesdays and usually people don't ask me. So I'd put the questions up early morning, Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock in the morning and then I would start answering at 9 o'clock at night and people wouldn't start asking questions until about half nine. <laughs> last minute Larry's all the time. But in this case here, you can't be last minute. I need to record this to, to get it out on the different platforms. But anyway, uh, AH Photos has asked another question as well. G greedy. No compliments. This is the first time ever I got, I got no compliments. I used to always get compliments on my Duffer's Tuesday tips. Send in your compliments too. I do love a good compliment. Um, what would be your one or two... What, what is this? What would be your one or two must-have lenses for landscape photography? Okay. Depending on the system. Um, my go-to lens is the widest lens you can get. That's my go-to lens. So I'm using, on the Sony system, I'm using the Tamron 17 to 28 f2.8. I do really like this Sony 20mm f1.8, using it for um, Astro recently. It's a really sharp lens, so I might be actually moving to using that exclusively for my uh, my landscape photography, because I usually shoot pretty wide as it is. So I'm usually in and around between 17 to 20 mils full frame on my landscape photography. So that would be my go-to, is ultra-wide. So, you know, you're 15 to is it 15 to 30 Nikon and is that the same for I can't even remember I'm so bad today I, I really I, I've literally just ignored what Canon and Nikon have been doing for the last while so I can't even remember what they have out um, but yeah up to 7 you know 17 mil to the basically the 16 to 35 range that's one of the go-to lenses. And then I am a, I am becoming a good bit of a fan of using the longer telephoto lenses, the 150 to 600s. Um, Fred, Fred Kelly and Ricardo Ray down in Dublin, they've, they've had a big influence on, um, on, on me with the photos that they're sharing. So if you want to check them out, that's uh, Raw Dublin and Majestic Dublin on Instagram. Have a look at some of their photos of, you know, the sun rising over the lighthouses around Dublin. Just phenomenal stuff and there's a big there's a big trend in Dublin at the minute for photographers to be using the longer focal lengths and yeah it's it's a more challenging thing to do you have to plan a lot more for these photos but it's really cool and I'm, I'm actually loving it when I when I got that Harbour Line photo with the lighthouse behind it um like for me personally that's my photo of the year that's my favorite photo I've gotten to shoot this year and I would never been able to get that without such a long focal length so uh, it is very niche but you do get some cool shots with it so I would go ultra wide or ultra telephoto. I wouldn't really stick in the middle. There's nothing really much there. Um, if you do have a 24 or 105, that will cover you for some of the, you know, for, for other compositions that may need to just to narrow your field of view a little bit. But for most cases, in my for my taste anyway, I go ultra wide. And then for the extreme cases, I go for the ultra telephoto. So uh, yeah, I don't know if that's, going to help you at all but if I was to choose two two lenses to bring with me you know ignoring the fact that I need to bring a second camera for my behind the scenes and all that there that's a different story completely but I would bring an ultra wide a 17 to 28 and a 150 to 600 because they just you know it's just it has you covered for everything you want you get the you get the big wide vista then you also get to zoom in to the, the details of the trees now, now that we're coming into um, autumn and all that there so you know it, it covers you I think fully and yeah. 
Right, anyway, that is all the questions that we have. We didn't have many. Usually you have about maybe 20. So hopefully next week I can get more. So I'll push this a little bit further. I didn't push it too much. I didn't actually let anyone know I was going to be getting you to submit your questions on a Monday so I can answer on a Tuesday. So, and a good few people last week thought I was just done and dusted with Duffer's Tuesday tips. Like I got the t-shirt, you know what I mean? I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. This is, this is the beginning. I did two and a half years. Let's see if we can go for another two and a half years. So... I hope you enjoyed this. Hope you got something from this. If you if you're on YouTube, like, subscribe, and ring the bell to get notified every time I post up a new video. If you're on podcasts, I hope you enjoyed my beautiful voice. And um, yeah, I look forward to sharing more thoughts and ideas that I have for the podcast. I'm going to be doing different things. I'm not going to be sharing like okay, then this one here you can you can watch it and you can listen to it. But not everything I do is going to be on YouTube, and not everything I do is going to be on podcast. So you know, because different things suit it. And I, I do think that sharing my opinions about landscape photography and you know just my general thoughts I don't think that works on YouTube but I think that works great on podcasts so that's some of the stuff that I hope to actually move into doing in the next coming weeks and stuff to get there so I'm going to record a couple of things in the next couple of days because I do know I can't get on to Spotify or Apple Music until I have a bigger following on the podcast so I need to build that up so bear with me it is going to be on the Podbean or the Bean Pod or whatever it's called I can't remember what the name of that thing is so yeah hope you enjoyed this hope you got something from this and I'll see you all later later Gators <laughs>